in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our webinar today, Why Are Risk Assessments Hard? My name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Three Lines Publishing, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide. I'm also attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Uh, my associate at Digital Business Law Group, John Nelson, is also joining us today. Say hello, John. Hey, everybody. How's it going? So we got a lot of attendees uh, today. Um, if you've been with us before, which I know many of you have, uh, you know that we like to take questions as we go. Uh, Martin and Gwen, uh, Director of Operations for Three Lines, will be trolling the chat. And that's how you can submit your questions. And from time to time, I will take a pause and we will take questions. We will also take questions. Uh, at the end, it's scheduled to go for, I believe, an hour and a half. Is that correct, Martin? Yes, it is. Sometimes we go a little bit over, depending on on, on uh, the number of questions or the kind of rants I may go off on. Um, learning objectives. We want to provide a foundational understanding of risk assessments under the HIPAA security rule. And principally, they're difficulty just because everybody that we know struggles with uh, risk assessments. They're inordinately complex, and um, we want to describe the reasons why that's so, and hopefully a, talk about um, a product that we're about to release here in, in, in a couple of months called Espresso that purports to reduce a significant amount of that pain. Uh, but in order to understand what Espresso does, you really need to understand why uh, it is so painful. Um, we also want to talk about a methodology. You know, with our subscription plan, uh, it's our belief you get more than just training products and, and checklists and policies. Uh, we've actually tried to infuse the subscription program with a, a repeatable, verifiable compliance methodology and approach so that you can develop a compliance program, not just, uh, you know, make some ticky marks on I've met this requirement or that requirement because one of the things that HHS is looking for is uh, whether or not a covered entity or business associate is attempting to institute a culture of compliance, which really means a, a, a um, a mind change with respect to how compliance is approached. Are you approaching it as this bolt-on necessary evil, or are you actually trying to work compliance into your day-to-day -day clinical, operational, financial workflows and make it part of your DNA, part of what you do to add value to a patient's experience? Talk a little bit about the, the responsible parties. Um, Obviously, the compliance officer and the executive team are on the hook, but um, there's probably a lot more folks that are on the hook, um, depending on how large your organization is. So finally, really, we're going to provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of how your HIPAA risk assessment should be conducted uh, now that HIPAA is no longer a paper tiger. So to um, expand on that a little bit, if you haven't conducted a risk assessment since the High Tech Act was promulgated in 2009 and you have a breach or you have a patient complaint, file complaint with HHS and on the face of that complaint it shows that you're in willful neglect. For example, you refused for whatever reason to provide the patient uh, their medical records. That, would, that forces, mandates an investigation one of the things, the obvious things that HHS is going to ask for is show me your last risk assessment because um, the premise is, and it's completely valid, that if you haven't done a risk assessment, there's just no way that you can be in compliance with the security rule. That's more or less what it amounts to. So um, 
It turns out that most people focus uh, risk, assessments, risk assessments on uh, uh, the security rule. I mean, it is part of the security rule, but it does touch the privacy rule and the breach notification rule in uh, in, in some important ways. Um, and if you look at implementation specification two under the first standard of the administrative safeguards, which is really your risk management program or your risk mitigation program, that particular implementation specification in some ways swallows the entirety of the three rules. It really is your sort of governance program for for everything. And it's just curious that uh, HHS wrote and the, the Congress wrote the statute and, and HHS wrote the regulations in that particular way, but um, that's the way they did it, so we have to live with um, what we got. Obviously, this is our compliance continuum. There are There is no requirement, and this is really, really important, um, both from a practical perspective and from a legal perspective, that you understand that there is no requirement for any kind of perfect uh, risk assessment. I'm, I'm using the term risk assessment. It's the term that is used by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Specifically, we borrowed their uh, methodology in special publication 800-30, how to conduct a risk assessment. Um, but the implementation specification in security rule actually calls it risk analysis. So. If you hear those two terms bantied about, they, they're really synonymous. The NIST called it risk assessment. Everybody I know who's sort of implemented any kind of product or training around um, around this implementation specification refers to it as a risk assessment. The actual implementation specification calls it a risk analysis. It's really the same thing. Um, the analysis may actually be more accurate because there is no, and this is a really critical distinction as well, there is no remediation that takes place during a risk analysis. A risk analysis or a risk assessment is purely an analytical step. You're supposed to discover, um, you know, uh, pair threats and vulnerabilities, discover risk, which risks you have, and then decide which um, security controls you're going to implement to reduce those risks to levels that are reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, complexity, uh, et cetera. But there is no requirement to do remediation uh, in that step. Okay, You could have your first risk assessment complete, a report of how you intend to proceed, uh, you would proceed in the next implementation, implementation specification risk mitigation and you could probably, probably make a good faith argument that you're not in willful neglect, you just haven't gotten to the remediation step yet. Okay, that doesn't mean that you won't get slapped on the risk, but it does mean that it, it, at least you can say you've completed a risk analysis. Now the reason we say no story, good story, fully compliant is that no story means pretty much you've stuck your head in the sand and you've done nothing since the High Tech Act has been promulgated and you're thumbing your nose at the law. Good story is that you are attempting to comply with the security rule and that you have a program in place that will allow you to get better and better at uh, showing visible demonstrable evidence at the granularity level of a requirement over time. That's what you're trying to improve and fully compliant is really this aspirational goal that almost no organization is ever going to reach. Um, so Martin, I doubt that there's any questions at this point, but I will, I will ask in any case. No, sir, we are sitting here waiting for questions. Okay, so one of the crazy hard things about doing a risk assessment is that you don't understand the lingo. 
Okay, and let me just share with you that if you have a clinical background or you have an administrative background and you've been given this task because you've been named the security officer, then obviously you clearly you know don't understand the lingo. You're not really an information technology person, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, but I'm going to clue you in on a dirty little secret here. Most information technology people, that's a really, really broad um, description of participants in a particular industry, okay? Within that, within that uh, information um, technology industry, there are dozens of roles from developers to database administrator to project manager to quality assurance to, I mean, literally dozens of roles, okay, help desk, uh, et cetera. And out of all those roles, information security is really, really a, a small niche within information technology. So in, most information technologists could be network experts or not security professionals so when you you know feel like pulling your hair out when you first look at what a risk assessment requires you're going to be in good company because most information technology professionals that have looked at the problem also want to pull their hair out okay unless uh, unless they happen to be information um, security professionals and then maybe um, maybe they're only pulling out their their eyebrows in their uh, on their you know on top of their eyes because it's still a really daunting daunting sort of problem so that's the first thing you need to recognize is that it, it, you really need to learn this new vocabulary it's like learning a, a foreign language uh, uh, until you learn the vocabulary you're really going to be wandering around the desert you know uh, in search of water and walking in circles. So if this is a baseline requirement of learning any foreign languages to learn the basic vocabulary. We're going to go through, you can read this, so I don't, I'm not going to read each one to you, but we're going to highlight some key uh, definitions. Um, and we're going to start with ACID. And, and, and ACID is a thing that access stores, maintains, or transmits information and it includes, generally people think of assets as hardware, routers, PC, servers, telephones, you know, but assets, and we're going to be using the Espresso terminology, okay, uh, you'll see later that we really call an asset, what other people would call an asset, a security object. We're going to talk to you uh, why we call it, because security objects, contain information systems, processes, buildings, people. These are all things that are not hardware devices, right, that are usually not associated with any kind of inventory. Uh, and the Espresso Grammar, we call those things a security object, and we're going to talk a little bit about why we call it a, a security object and not an asset. That brings up a um, uh, another good point about uh, being in good company when you're starting in on on doing a risk assessment is, is that uh, even if you are a um, information security professional, uh, you, you've got a leg up as far as being a bit more familiar with the sorts of uh, um, vocabulary. But the vocabulary uh, really mirrors the fact that risk assessment risk assessments in general extend beyond just uh, technical requirements. You know, it, it goes beyond just dealing with making sure you've got firewalls, encryption, and all the techie stuff. It also goes to have your uh, staff been trained. You know, are your, um, are your buildings secured? Are the rooms within those buildings secured? Like who has access to what uh, in the physical realm as well as the digital realm? So um, it, it's really a, uh, a holistic approach to security, and that sort of plays into um, why we call um, an asset a security object to encompass that greater meaning. 
Right. So even the information security professionals uh, are at somewhat of a disadvantage. They tend to look at the problem really through a more myopic looking at devices and patching routers and servers and you know establishing the perimeter and things like that. And that is really much too narrow a view uh, to encompass the regulatory regime, um, aka the HIPAA security rule is much broader than that, uh, than just looking at those things, okay? So if, if, if you just throw this over the wall and make it an information technology issue, you've already lost, okay? And now there's widespread agreement because of all the talk of cyber warfare that, that uh, cyber security, which is really what we're talking about here, has to be a C-suite issue. Well, there may be recognition in most circles now that it's a C-suite issue. I, I seriously doubt that most of the executive suites have actually taken it on. They may agree in theory, but they probably have not taken time to understand what that means in practice. And in particular, in practice, it likely means um, better training for security officers and increased budget, um, so forth. Okay, so. Um, it, it, it's a daunting, daunting problem, even if you're an information security professional. And we talk about authentication. This is a theme that you hear a lot. It's really verifying that the identity of a user, a process, or a device is what that user, process, or device purports to be. Okay, are you are you who you say you are? And one of the things that you need to recognize here, it's not just people. It's also processes that are logging in, for example, for interoperability for providers sending patient records back and forth. It's also devices uh, that may either mobile devices or the Internet of Things that may want access to the network. How do you authenticate that? That's a, a huge uh, problem uh, going forward. Uh, the term exploitation means whether a specific threat takes advantage of or triggers a given vulnerability. So when you're looking at a risk assessment uh, according to the NIST methodology, you first have to pair up threats and vulnerabilities. And when you first try to do this, you, you really get lost between, you know, what's a threat, what's a vulnerability. Sometimes they seem like they're interchangeable. What's a control? You know, it, 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 it gets um, it gets to be quite complex from a semantic perspective if you're not sort of oriented as to what you're trying to do. And the NIST uh, uh, 800SP30 uh, tries to give you that background, but still you're looking at and you're dealing with levels of abstraction that uh, – that are quite difficult to put all the pieces together so that they make sense and you can actually begin to even attempt to do a reasonable uh, risk assessment. Now, the concept of an impact, and as we'll see, uh, figures prominent into the calculation of risk. And impact is the magnitude of harm that could be expected to result as a consequence of a particular threat exploiting a specific vulnerability and what kind of business damage that would do to your organization, okay? Destruction, loss, unavailability of uh, information. Um, that's, that's what you're talking about as far as impact is what is the business harm? If this threat, uh, let's say the threat is some major weather event, um, you know, it, uh, triggers this vulnerability, which could be no redundant power supply, what is that going to do to your business? Um, and so it figures, it figures um, prominently in the calculation of risks. Um, information system is used broadly in the security role. You know, you can think of that as people, process, and platform. It's more than just uh, the software, but even information system is not a wide enough term uh, 
to um, encompass what you should be taking an inventory of, and that's why we call it security objects. And you'll see here in in a little while the reason we call this inventory, what you would call inventory, an inventory of security objects, is it because it turns out that security objects are what you apply security controls to. Okay, so if you're trying to reduce risk, the levels that are reasonable and appropriate in your organization, at the end of the day, what the risk analysis is going to do is going to identify controls, security controls, that you apply to security objects in an attempt to reduce those risks. Okay? Integrity is about of being able to track whether someone has modified and or destroyed information once it's been persisted. This is an inordinately uh, difficult uh, problem to solve. You're going to have to probably look to EHR vendors to get better and better at uh, using hash algorithms and other kind of algorithms to say, hey, last time I persisted this information that had this value, now when I'm reading it, it doesn't have the same value, therefore something or someone changed the information. Now recently, about a month ago, there was a, uh, a, a cyber security breach at a hospital in Melbourne, Australia, which I think turned into uh, an instance of ransomware where the hackers actually went in and started changing patient data. So you can imagine what kind of havoc that would wreak to a hospital if you start changing patient blood types or changing medications that patients are to receive. You could easily, the hospital could easily wind up killing people because of those destructive uh, tampering with data. And it's an inordinately complex problem to deal with from a, 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 a technology perspective. And I, I, I I didn't get the follow-up news, but I assume that they held the hospital up for ransom saying, if you don't pay us money, then we're not going to restore the data to its original state. Uh, tampering. And, go ahead, uh, Chuck. If I can, uh, tampering is, is in, in a lot of ways um, more harmful than, than simply removing or, or deleting things. Just uh, just from being able to understand that you have a problem, to realize that something is going awry is obviously the first step towards fixing it. And with modification of data, um, it's it can be very difficult if you've got, you know, even even like a thousand patients. You know, each one of those patients has so many uh, pieces of information associated with them. I mean, your your system is juggling just probably hundreds of thousands of pieces of information, and if someone were to maliciously or even accidentally go in and um, and change some of that, you may not know uh, that the risk is there until it's already been exploited by something, until you've already gone past the point of no return. So um, in, in many ways that can be much more difficult to assess uh, than if something were just gone. No, exactly. It's, it, it, this idea of, of changing data or destroying data is much more insidious than your your average run-of-the-mill uh, breach for the reasons John just said. You you uh, you can wind up killing folks really uh, easily. Uh, likelihood in our calculation of risk based on NIST SP 830. Okay, it's all subjective. We're not trying to do this math, mathematical algorithm of, you know, it, 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 the attempts have been tried at that and really it's just a fallacy of composition that you could actually do any kind of mathematical uh, uh, calculations based on the probability of this threat exercising this vulnerability. For each one of these risks, you're going to have to make a subjective decision as to whether the probability is high, medium, or low. You're going to make a subjective decision as to the impact, and ultimately you're going to make a subjective decision as to the, whether the risk is high, medium, or low. But the, the intent here is that you look at each risk and you think hard about what could happen, and that is the 
value that you get out of the exercise. And until you start thinking hard, which is really what a risk analysis is, you're thinking hard about the potential harm that could could be caused to your organization, right? That is the whole exercise. How hard, how rigorously did you attack this problem, which in lay terms turns into how hard did you think about it, right? And what did you put in place to try to reduce risk to those weasel words in the security rule to, to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Now, your operational environment is the physical, technical, organizational setting in which an information system operates. I would really modify that and say it's the physical, technical, and organizational setting in which security objects interact, okay, because we think it's it's bigger than just an information system. Uh, but but uh, NIST uses information system as a generality. Uh, what is risk? Risk is the net mission impact, considering the probability that a particular threat will exploit a, a vulnerability and the resulting business impact if that occurs. So you have this equation. You have a threat, a specific threat. You have a specific vulnerability. What's the probability of that? Then you determine an impact to your business, and then you give the, you give both uh, subjective values of high, medium, or low, and then you determine risk, okay? And the number of risks you can determine are being, could be in the dozens and the hundreds, potentially in the thousands, depending on how you abstract it out, okay? Uh, what's a risk methodology, assessment methodology? Well, you know, it's an approach, right? And we're using uh, SP 830 from NIST. That's what NIST recommends for all government agencies, it's, it's been blessed, it's been vetted, uh, it's used by hundreds of government agencies, and so that is kind of the bedrock methodology for conducting the risk assessment, and as we'll uh, discuss later, that is what um, Espresso is based on, okay. Risk response. Just keep in mind that the response is not part of the risk analysis. That comes in the second step. Now, security controls, and um, I'm going to stop again, Martin. We're going through these in, in a little more detail because we've uh, expressoized these. But are there any questions here? Martin? Yes, I'm here. Does the fact that a breach occurs automatically mean that you are not compliant with the HIPAA regulations? Well, you know, a breach, breach is a term of art, and it has a particular uh, definition, okay? And, um, you, you know, it has a definition and it has some exceptions, and then it has sort of this a analytical framework that you got to uh, uh, walk through, okay, to determine whether or not breach notification is actually triggered, okay. So it's really a term of art, you know, and we can go through it quickly just to give you a feel for what the framework is first you have to you have to ask yourself was there a, was there a violation of the privacy rule if there's no violation of the privacy rule there is no breach by definition that begs the question do you have an analytical framework do you have a methodology that you can consistently go through to determine whether or not the privacy rule has been violated if the answer is no then you're going to have a tough time doing a breach uh, analysis because you're you're dead at the first step. You can't even figure out whether or not the privacy rule has been violated, or you don't have a methodology for that. Second part of that is, you know, was there a violation of of um, the privacy rule of unsecured protected health information? So, if the protected health information has been encrypted according to the secretary's protocol, there is no breach by definition because that's the breach safe harbor, okay? Uh, now, if you find yourself that there was no encryption, 
privacy rule was violated, then you ask yourself, well, does one of the three exceptions to the breach definition apply? And really what you're asking is, does the fact pattern that just occurred, what we, what we think is a breach, does that match with one of these exceptions? If it matches, then there's no breach by definition, okay? And finally, you have to say, well, if there's no, if the privacy rule is violated, it wasn't encrypted, none of the exceptions apply, is, was there a low probability that the PHI was compromised? And if you reach that third step, you're probably dead in the water because it's your burden of proof to prove low probability, you being the covered entity or the business associate, and, um, and it's presumed to be a breach. Legally, at this point, it's presumed to be a breach. So you can imagine you have a high hurdle, a high burden of proof to overcome, to rebut that presumption, okay? So if you go back to the question, which, Martin, I'm going to ask you to repeat. Does the fact that a breach occurs automatically mean that you are not compliant with the HIPAA regulations? Yes. If you go through all that analysis that we just did and you determine that a breach occurred, you are, to quote the questioner, automatically in violation uh, of the rules. Okay, and and it, depending on the size of the breach, you're going to get you're 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 going to get a, an audit, and when you get that audit, depending on what HHS finds, you could get many many more uh, violations. Some of them for willful neglect, depending on what you've done or haven't done. For example, if you haven't done a risk assessment, you're dead in the water. That's willful neglect. That's fifty thousand dollar fine right there. In addition to the fines for the breach, I'm not talking about the fines for the breach right now, you could get fined a million and a half dollars just for the breach, and that's not including the notification cost, okay, which the Ponemon Institute says that are at like 300 per record, right, so you can imagine even 5,000 records, and if you were doing it at 200 per record, that's a million dollars, so not only are you going to be in violation of the rules, you're going to have a really bad day if you have a breach. You have a really bad day if you got a a, a a mobile phone or a laptop that just disappears or gets lost that has PHI on it. Okay, so yeah, your problem is going to be much much bigger than just a violation of the rules. You're going to be in serious uh, liability with respect to legal fines, uh, etc. So. Security objects we talked about, but here's a uh, wider definition. Go uh, ahead. There's a few more questions. Um, we have always treated the EPHI data as an asset, not the PC or the object. Is that too narrow? Yeah, that, yeah, that's way too narrow. You have to identify the the the, the information. The EPHI is what you're trying to protect. Okay. The assets are the, what we call the security objects, right? Operations, individual assets, places, networks. It's really, really broad. It's anything that you can apply a security control to, including people, your workforce, okay? Those are the things that you apply security controls to in order to protect the information. So, yes, on the one hand, you can, you know, as an abstraction, you can think of EPHI as an asset, but for the purposes of a risk analysis, a risk assessment, that, that is not the asset, that is the, ultimate, um, that is the ultimate thing that you're trying to protect. So you need to think about, uh, really, we would prefer that you think about security objects because it's bigger than assets, all right? And, and that's what you apply security controls to. And we're going to let you in on a little secret that uh, Expresso actually manifests that makes this process a lot simpler for you than this wide open world of millions of threats and millions of vulnerabilities and things that it's almost impossible to get your mind around. Um, but uh, let me let me answer a few other questions right now if they're queued up. Uh, we, we have, uh, no, there's just a comment here. Um, it's a recent comment that, that happened and that, that would be the last. This is an FYI. Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital paid a $17,000 ransom to hackers who had put 
ransomware on their system, and this was as of February 5th, 2016. Right. That's a reason. That's a recent occurrence uh, that occurred here in the United in the United States, and I, I, I know that it was ransomware. I didn't read the details, and it wasn't clear to me uh, that it was in city as insidious as what happened in Melbourne. Obviously, you know, Austra Australia is not subject to the HIPAA regulations, but um, you know, it, it, it goes to show you how insidious uh, that can be when they when they start changing patient data and the kind of liability that a um, uh, you know that that a hospital or a practice could be facing. Um, the thing that I was going to mention, you know, with the hospital especially, there are no longer perimeters on cybersecurity. I mean, the, all the bedside machines are working off Wi-Fi, so you you just got an open. Everything's open to the world if if they're good at what they do. Yeah, I wouldn't say that they're no longer. Uh, perimeters. You still have to. You still have to have your firewalls and 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 things like that. I mean, it would be, it, it would be grossly negligent not to have that. The, the I think what Martin is is trying to uh, express is that the consensus by all the security professionals today is that the perimeter cannot be defended. Okay, there are far too many vectors uh, allowing uh, someone into your network that it's impossible. To uh, defend the perimeter, and so you have to devise a strategy that assumes that the perimeter is violated, and then what do you do? And obviously, encryption, two-factor authentication, all these other things come into play as to what you do. But you can't uh, you you can't assume that the perimeter can be defended. The barbarians are at the gates. Yes, the barbarians are at the gates, and and there's just simply no uh, no stopping them. Uh, technical controls are just a, a specific kind of security control that you can uh, implement. The threat is a potential for a person or thing to exercise or trigger a vulnerability. Okay, and that all may sound good when you're sort of reading this thing. When you actually get down to doing it, this whole abstraction between threat, vulnerability, control. It's easy to get lost in the weeds, and, and, and hopefully we're going to demonstrate a, a way to avoid a lot of that complexity. The threat landscape is really flaws or weaknesses in system security procedures. Uh, you know, really those are describing, even here, right, and this is a definition coming from NIST, this, flaws or weaknesses are really more describing threats. I mean, vulnerabilities than, than threats, right? Threats are what the bad guys are up up to figuring out how they're going to breach the perimeter, how they're going to do SQL injection, how they're going to do a social engineering phishing um, expedition to get credentials, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, right. so, so there are really, um, uh, if I can jump in, uh, there are really two sides to, uh, to the same coin. So, and, and even if they aren't, uh, if they aren't threats from hacking, you, if we go to uh, say a weather event, you know, uh, hurricane. The hurricane is the threat that exploits the vulnerability that you have no redundancy in your power. So, um, so um, once the threat exploits that vulnerability, hurricane knocks out the power, no redundancy. That's where to go back to our uh, formula. You have the threat vulnerability, and that winds you up with um, with having to assess what the impact of that particular threat, exploiting that particular vulnerability, will have on your organization and how you conduct your business. So, um, so it's, it's important to understand that, um, that that interplay can both be intentional and just a matter of, of uh, mother nature as well, or just, um, you know, just as a uh, laptop can be stolen, it can simply be lost. So, um, so that's an, um, a valuable thing to take from um, um, the threat vulnerability dichotomy, as it were. Yeah, and that, and that, I mean, you, you, you can get lost in the language. Now, what we've done, and we're going to get to as a way of explaining our abstraction for Espresso to minimize uh, uh, the to minimize the ambiguity in all these abstractions. Um, 
what we've come to and what we validated against what the industry has done is that each implementation specification in the security rule is nothing but a control that you should implement. For example, you know, if you have some kind of social engineering scheme, well, that social engineering scheme is uh, more likely to work if you have no risk assessment program. And what what is the control from the security rule, implementation number one? Develop, implement, deploy a risk assessment, right? So that's kind of like that matter, antimatter. The lack of it is the vulnerability. Having it is the control, but uh, as far as as far as the research we've done, nobody's I think had this aha epiphany that oh every implementation specification in the security rule is really a kind of control that you should be implementing. And yes, you are trying to do something. You're trying to do two things at the same time. Okay, one is essentially you're trying to Katrina proof your practice. You're trying to make sure that you can. Do, you can recover after a disaster. A disaster could be a breach, it could be a weather event, it could be power outage, it could be any number of threats, okay, that could cause the disaster. And you're, you're trying to Katrina proof. That's what you're trying to do as a practical matter. But you're also, okay, you're also trying to cope with and meet the requirements of a specific regulatory regime that we've come to know and love as the HIPAA security rule, okay? In other words, you're going to have to comply with 164.308A1 implementation standard one implementation specification risk assessment, right? You have to comply with that, okay? And uh, what our research has determined is that, okay, the, the way you comply with that is you identify the vulnerability to which this control applies and you apply, you apply that control of having a risk assessment, having a risk management program, having strong passwords, on and on and on and on. Okay. Now, I got to tell you, I've been working with the security rule for a long, long time. It took me a while uh, before that it, aha moment came that that was exactly what was going on. Now, this particular, this particular implementation specification could and does apply to many, many vulnerabilities and threats, okay? But if we abstract, if we abstract the threats at a, a particular level, for example, social engineering or intrusion, right, we don't have to list the millions of ways that an intrusion could happen. We just take the position that if an intrusion happens, then it kicks off all these bad things, and no matter how an intrusion happens, you should have controls in place that deal with these bad things, and most of those controls, almost all of them, are going to come right from the security rule implementation uh, specification. Okay. Now, before we get to that, let's talk about agile methodologies, because this is a really, really wicked problem that you're not going to solve in one risk assessment, or two, or three. Right? It's that complex, you're going to have to eat this elephant one, one bite at a time. It turns out that most of the technology projects fail because of people process challenges, because of organizational challenges, because you don't understand the problem that you're solving, you don't have the budget for it, et cetera, et cetera. You're overwhelmed. Your organization is essentially ill-prepared. Now, most organizations are ill-prepared because we've all now come kicking and screaming into the 21st century where Breaches happen on a daily basis where information technology, these devices that we use, we can't live and work without. Our whole world has been turned upside down as far as how we conduct business, but our underlying processes and ways of thinking about how we deal with this has not caught up. Okay, And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to catch up with all these changes. So we're going to have to do it iteratively, right? So security rule implementation is more aptly described as a change project. Learning how to conduct an effective risk assessments is going to be a change to the way your organizations think your organizations think about risk. Okay? And it's going to happen iteratively, not not overnight. So 
We like to use the term Agile methodology. It's a group of methods based on an iterative and incremental approach, evolutionary development of compliance, and acknowledges that to a changing technical and regulatory environment, because the pace of change is acceleration is accelerating, the implementation cycle never ends. This is not a risk assessment. Uh, is not a set and forget thing. In fact, at a minimum, you should be doing once every year, and probably you should be doing one once a quarter. And we think with Espresso, you will be able to do one once a quarter, okay? Because the bad guys are learning way too fast. To in a year, we're talking internet time. That's like one year on the internet is like 20 dog years, right? It's a long, long time for the bad guys to get an advantage. So um, this uh, expression from Tom Peters that he developed. A long, long time ago, and Tom Peters wrote in Search of Excellence, Thriving on Chaos, yada, 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 you know, encapsulates what Agile is, is fail forward fast, get started, do your first risk assessment, learn from that, make it better next time. There's no requirement for it. There's no legal requirement. I'm here to tell you that there's no legal requirement for anything called a perfect risk assessment because that is a non sequitur. There are no perfect risk assessments. They don't exist. The only thing that exists is risk assessments that, that are practical and that you hope will, uh, over time, get better and better at what? At reducing risk levels to to uh, risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, complexity, etc. So why fail forward fast? Because that's really the only way to attack a wicked problem. And by wicked here, we mean difficult. This is a difficult problem and it's going to be different for each organization. So, you know, wicked problems are the kind of problems that you don't really understand until you've started developing the solution. And we guarantee you that you're not going to have an epiphany that implementation specification to the security rule really controls until you start actually trying to implement and think harder about it. It's not something that you're just going to see, okay? There's no stopping rule. I mean, where do you stop if you identify, you know, thousands of risks? Well, you don't have budgets to, uh, to solve all thousands of risks. This go around, you're going to have to pick and choose and say, we're going to tackle these 10 or 20, and next time the other 10 or 20, and so forth, right? And solutions are not right or wrong. They're just better than others, worse, good enough, etc. Okay? What What is unacceptable to HHS is that you just stuck your head in the sand and said, Ah, no, we're not going to do this. It's just too hard. That's that's not an acceptable response. Okay, and so you know we borrowed this from the risk framework. This is the this is the risk management framework methodology simplified. You assess, you simplify, you protect, you monitor, report, and you do that over and over again. So it turns out that big problems, really, really big problems, like how to do a risk assessment, require many many, many small solutions, okay? It's not that the solution at the end of the day is going to be trivial or small. It's that, it's that the better solution is going to be built on top of many, many small, good, incremental solutions. So the most important advice that we can give you to solve a wicked problem is to get started because I guarantee you that you don't understand the problem until you actually start facing the daunting task of, What's a threat? What's a vulnerability? What's a risk? How do I calculate it, uh, et cetera? So I'm going to take another uh, pause here, Martin, and see if there's questions. Yes, we have one question. It seems that everything we've discussed so far addresses the potential of a breach, but doesn't HIPAA also seriously address the need to bring being a need to being able to continue providing Healthcare services, which is why weather disaster planning, et cetera, is critical. Yeah, this all doesn't have to do. Uh, um, I mean, there's there's one way of looking at the the, the you know a, a threat. If, if you look at the a threat as um, um, an intrusion, right? Then you're looking at it from the potential of a uh, of, of a breach, but let me let me do something I normally do not do, and I'm going to share with you a little secret sauce since we're not really since we're not really shipping um, espresso yet. But 
we, we are working on the problem. This is the best way that I can answer your question right now is to show you what we what we're calling our threats and vulnerabilities uh, sort of master database. Okay, and I'm going to move this, and then Martin, you tell me, can you see that okay? Yes, I can see it all right. Okay, so notice a couple of things. One is that the threat is social engineering or intrusion. We've abstracted away. We don't care the millions of ways that you could get in. What are the vulnerabilities? Well, once you're in, if you don't have a risk assessment process, that's a vulnerability. If you don't have a risk mitigation program, that's a vulnerability. If you don't have any protection against malicious software, that's a vulnerability. If you have no login monitoring, that's a vulnerability. If you have no password management. In other words, where do these things come from? We can tell you right here. Here's the authority. right? The control is conduct an act for a risk assessment, conduct an accurate, thorough risk assessment, blah, 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 blah. That's actually a security rule implementation specification. Now, one answer to the, the, the question is, that security, that a risk assessment has to do with, um, it really should be broader than this, but it has to do with EPHI, okay? It's not the world of HIPAA compliance. It's actually, deal, although it does deal with breach and it does touch the privacy rule, from an HHS perspective, they, they've said the security rule only pertains to electronic PHI, right? So that's what you're trying to deal with. But, for example, if you had an, ext an extrusion, if you had an intrusion that wiped out your uh, entire uh, backup and you didn't have a backup and recovery plan, then you're going to be in a world of hurt, right? So it triggers all these implementation controls. But then you have a weather event. A weather event is not uh, a weather event like Katrina. That's not a. That's not a. That's not a breach. That's just something that knocks you down knocks your entire process down, right? And how are you going to recover? No, no data backup plan, no disaster recovery plan, no emergency mode. These are all vulnerabilities if you have that kind of threat. What are your responses? Well, your responses are the security controls. Now, these are not the only responses, okay? These are not the only response. These are not the only controls that you could implement. And we point you to some others, and we point you to some industry standard controls. But these are the controls that the HIPAA security rule requires you, uh, and, and sometimes they're addressable, but often requires you to implement. So if you've implemented these controls, then you can make a, a good faith argument to an auditor or, or to a court of law that you're complying with the HIPAA security rule. In other words, we are not trying to solve when we get to looking at Espresso the world's problems. We are trying to abstract uh, a good part of the world's problems in a manner that lets you deal with the HIPAA security rule in a way that's accessible to you. And we actually will pre-populate Espresso with these threats, vulnerabilities, and risks, and then let you decide on a risk-by-risk -risk level Okay, what's the probability of this threat exploiting this vulnerability? Oh, it's high, medium, or low. What's the impact? Oh, you pick. Okay, what's the risk? It's high, it's medium. Okay, what control are you going to implement? Well, here are the controls that you're going to implement, right? Because these are because the implementation specifications in the security rule are essentially security controls. Does that make sense? I mean, that should that should prompt questions. Okay, uh, because, we do, go ahead. We do have one question so far. How do I get a hold of Expresso? <laughs> okay, so we have a subscription plan. We're going to talk about Espresso here in a minute, but uh, Espresso, Espresso is going to be sold as part of our subscription plan. Right now, those subscribers of ours understand that for $795 a year, we, we, we provide you with like 20 training classes, security rule checklists, model policies, uh, business associate contracts, lots of things that you can use for remediation. Well, if you, if you, if you subscribe 
before March 15th, right, like so in a month or so, then you're going to get Expresso for free. And, I mean, just as part of your subscription, okay, not, not, not free, but as part of the $7.95. After March 15th, and you'll be grandfathered in, you'll only ever have to pay the $495 renewal for optional renewal for the year out years, the next year and the year after that. After March 15th, it's going to be $24.95 for Expresso and our subscription plan, okay? And we still think that at that price point, there's nobody in the market that's delivering that kind of value. Everybody else that even comes close is just delivering a product like Expresso for over, uh, and when we believe not as good as Expresso, for over $10,000 without getting all the training, model policies, blah, 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 blah. So that's how you get Expresso is, in a couple of months, uh, we've specified it. I'm going to show you some screenshots here in a second, um, and we should have, we should hopefully be shipping in a couple of months. When you talk about a risk assessment, this is what you're talking about: risk analysis. This is the first implementation specification of the security rule. This is what you're trying to comply with. All right. So again, we're not trying to solve the world's problems. We're trying to help you comply with the HIPAA security rule, which by the way, is a monster enough in and of itself, okay? So, um, and here are the risk assessment steps that you absolutely have to go through. And again, this is not, we didn't invent these. These, these come from NIST, okay? These are the NIST steps. The first thing you got to do is go gather data, gather your security objects, operations, assets, individuals, applications, databases, workflows, these are all the things that we call security objects because that's what you're going to apply security controls to. In Espresso, we're going to allow you to gather these and via a CSV file, bulk import them. Okay, yes, you're going to have to go dump your HR system to get your individual, your workforce members. You're going to have to scan your networks or do some other thing to get your uh, PCs and laptops, and, you know, we really can't help you, we can't automate that piece, but once you have that, you can put it in a, in a particular CSV file format, and we will bulk import that. The second thing is you got to do is gather threats and vulnerabilities that pertain to your operational environment. Well, Espresso is going to automatically create threats and vulnerabilities that we are aware of and that the security rule points out. Okay, and essentially what we're going to create are risk rows that, you know, these are threats, vulnerabilities, and then you've got to define the impact and the risk, and then you've got to figure out what the control is, and the control in that spreadsheet I just, uh, one of the controls is going to be one of the implementation specifications of the HIPAA security rule. Now, you're not going to be able to do all 18 or 20 in the first go-round, but that's not the expectation of HHS. HHS wants to see that you're making a good faith effort, okay? So these are examples of threats, social engineering or intrusion, weather or natural disaster, power outage, theft or loss, fire, denial of service, direct access attack, which by mean, what we mean by that is somebody physically got access to your building and either, uh, you know, logged in or stole, um, uh, uh, EPHI, workforce exfiltration, which means you had some bad guys working within your organization that just stole the EPHI, and identity theft, okay? So in, in our view of the world, there are probably hundreds of thousands of ways somebody could intrude, but with respect to uh, what controls you've got to put in place once they get in, it doesn't matter how they got in, okay? You have to put in certain controls that will uh, uh, mitigate the fact that now that they're in, what are we going to do, okay? And now that, that doesn't diminish the fact that how you actually prevent people from getting in has gotten any easier, but you got to keep this in mind, and it's, it's really, really important. The risk assessment that you're absolutely required to do is not the remediation step. It's only the analysis step. The remediation step comes in the next implementation specification, all right? And the examples of vulnerabilities are, you can think of this as matter and antimatter. 
These are all risk assessment process, risk mitigation program, information activity review, process to inform, inform workforce. Go read the HIPAA security rules and you're going to realize that these are all security rule implementation specifications. Okay? That's the matter. The vulnerability is the antimatter. You don't have them. No risk assessment, no process to inform workforce, no login monitoring, no incident reporting, no backup plan, and so forth. And what are the and what are the controls? Well, the controls are what the implementation specifications say you ought to do to mitigate these things. Okay, so vulnerabilities equals the antimatter of security rule implementation specification. That's um, that's a big takeaway from today's webinar, right? This is a big key to what Espresso is all about, is realizing that vulnerabilities are really the antimatter of the controls that are represented by the security rule implementation specification. So, Martin, I'm going to stop again and see if there's questions because we're covering a lot of ground. Okay. <clears throat> Could a risk assessment framework simply be based line for line on the standards in the security and privacy and breach notification rules? Well, you actually don't even need to go to those other two rules. Just as a matter of law, uh, it's, you only have to require you only have to do the security rule. So you only have to deal with the implementation specifications of the security rule. Uh, but in essence pulling all that information together, the threats, vulnerabilities, and all that. It, it, we, we, we have risk assessment training right now, and we have spreadsheets that help you do that. And if you've attempted to do it with spreadsheets, uh, you know how maddening it is from a complexity perspective. It gets out of control in a New York second, okay? Uh, it's inordinately complex, but Yes, to answer your question, what Espresso has done is taken all that and productized it for you. Productized this, so all you got to do is kind of um, not just fill in the blanks, it's more than fill in the blanks. You still have to think hard about whether this high is high, medium, or low. You have a disaster recovery plan, you have emergency recovery you know, mode, but it gives you, the, it productizes the framework and places you in the right spot where you can answer those questions. So by so doing, it abstracts away a lot of the complexity. Okay? Uh, now, these are all steps that you got to do. You got to assess your current security controls and minimize or eliminate risk to EPHI. So some controls you're going to have. Some of your systems are going to have automatic log off. You may already have a disaster recovery plan. Uh, maybe it's not as good as it ought to be. You may not have an emergency mode plan. So, you know, some of this stuff you're going to have, and you can just say, well, this is kind of a medium risk because we already have it. It's kind of working, blah, blah, blah. All right? And then you're going to have to get to this step four, which is determining that a likelihood that a particular threat will exploit a particular vulnerability. Well, we're not going to determine what that threat is for your organization, but we're going to create a risk row that says, okay, we have this threat, we got this vulnerability, you assign what, what you think the probability is. That's one click. You assign the impact, impact to your business organization. That's two clicks. You assign what the risk is. That's three clicks. So we're going to minimize the amount of work that you have to do because we've already done this pairing exercise for you. Impact that the exploitation will have on your organization where you're going to be able to pick from a drop-down list what that impact is, or create some new impact if you don't like what's already there, okay? And then determine the level of risk. So we've streamlined this seven-step process that if you tried to do it manually, you could, and we've tried, and we provide you some tools in our current uh, subscription plan, and it is a, a totally non-trivial thing to attempt to do with spreadsheets and uh, other other tools like that. So. John, I'm going to let you take over a little bit and explain this equation, and then we're going to get into a little bit about Espresso, and you can kind of drive. You can just tell me next slide when you're done here. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to start out by saying that uh, with what Espresso comes with built in, both the, um, the threats, the vulnerabilities, the controls, that is, that's a baseline. Um, 
you will be able to add in your own threats, vulnerabilities, and controls, just like you can add in your own security objects. You know, not all, every organization is the same, so it's uh, it's designed to start out with that baseline that will essentially apply to everyone, and um, and then you can add and modify things from there. You know, as it pertains to your organization. So what this chart really um, really shows is the formula for uh, determining what a risk is. I like to think of these uh, threats over here on your left, the orange, T1, T2, T, Tn, uh, and your vulnerabilities directly to the right of that, V1 through Vn. I like to think of these as uh, essentially the wheel on the price is right. So you can spin the wheel, look at all of, uh, spin your threat wheels, spin your vulnerability wheel, and that essentially forms a combination. So when you spin the threat wheel and you're looking at one particular threat, then you spin the vulnerability wheel to see what, uh, what vulnerabilities that particular threat um, can exploit. That's, the comb that's one combination that you're looking at. And one of uh, the things that Carlos was showing in how we streamline all of these different threats in that if you have an intrusion, it, and someone is already in, it doesn't matter how they've gotten in, as long as the same vulnerabilities are exposed, it, it really doesn't matter. So we've only, um, we've streamlined things based off of uh, what can actually be exploited. So uh, instead of having thousands of threats or hundreds of threats, we only have, we've broken that down to a few based off of the fact that, you know, 10 different threats uh, can exploit the exact same set of vulnerabilities. So they all are um, included as one. So with that being said, you look at your uh, threat vulnerability combination and that winds you up at the next step. So you're looking at the probability of that particular combination or whatever combinations can uh, exploit that threat, exploit that vulnerability. What's the probability, the P, of that exploitation actually occurring? And that, we're, we're using a, a, a time sign here, but that's only as an analogy. You know, as, as Carlos mentioned before, this isn't a mathematical thing. This is a holistic, judgment-based calculation. So the probability that a threat will exploit a vulnerability multiplied, kind of, by the impact that would happen if that vulnerability was exploited. And that's really what you get when you're looking at a risk. So probability times impact essentially is your risk of that particular combination coming together and ruining your day, or at least making your day a bit worse. So what Expresso really does and what our uh, content, which is going to be plugged into Expresso, really helps you with is being able to quickly identify all of your risks or most of your risks. You know, this will be an iterative uh, process and to streamline that means that you can get more uh, risk assessments done in a quicker amount of time. Say instead of once per year, you're doing it once per quarter, which means that you can attack the problem from this agile methodology that we always talk about in our webinars so you can gain a more comprehensive view of where your vulnerabilities can be exploited and what controls from the regulations you need to implement and that you've already implemented. So that, that's actually another side of Expresso is that it, you'll be able to keep track of what you've already done to remediate in your last, um, your last risk assessment. And from there, you know what's, what's left to be tackled. Uh, so one thing that we mentioned is hugging the monster. And you won't be able to hug it all at one time. So you start off by hugging its ankle, and then maybe its calf. You, you know, you, it's, it's a piece-by-piece piece thing. So uh, I think, um, I, I think this, this chart here really encapsulates what the method is from a... Um, uh, conceptual point of view, and then, you know, um, we're going to look at some screens here in a second, but Martin, are there any questions here on based on that? 
<clears throat> yes, there are. Uh, what are the primary differences between your Expresso product and the SRA tool developed by the ONC, OCR, and OGC? <laughs> um, well, you know, I'm going to be a little um, uncharming here and, and um, not so gracious. The, SCR, the SRA tool really, really sucks. It, it makes you do every, everything one at a time. It has no concept, really, of matching up the risk and the, uh, the probabilities in, the, in a way that you can uh, determine the risk. It, it is incapable of maintaining um, risk assessment instances over time. Espresso will allow you to maintain as many risk assessment instances over time, so you could go back five risk assessments ago and you could report what happened during that risk assessment, which risks were identified, which controls were applied. The SRA tool that uh, HHS released really was a, a mistake because it tried to oversimplify without providing really enough functionality to be of much use. So um, if you think that you're getting um, value of the uh, you using that free tool then I, I would say God bless you and good luck but I've looked at the tool and my short comments is it, it's um, it sucks essentially so uh, I, I want to point out that sucks is a term of art uh, but moving on I hear the term uh, security officer compliance officer and privacy officer are they one in the same like risk assessment versus risk analysis well, yeah, they could be. They could be. The security rule and the privacy rule says that you have to have a named privacy officer and you have to have a named security officer. Those are requirements of the rules, okay? And so an auditor is going to come in and say, might ask you, who is your named security officer? Well, you better have an answer to that. And that named security officer better not be surprised that he or she is the named security officer. And that named security officer, um, it goes without saying, should have some training as to what it means to be a security officer. Now, we like to think, uh, you know, and I had a conversation with a potential prospect today that we have over 20 training modules. If you take all 20 of them, uh, you're going to be a pretty well-informed uh, security officer and privacy officer, okay? And there is no requirement that you have to be an information security professional. You know, you got to remember that the HIPAA rules are uh, descriptive and not prescriptive. They tell you what needs to be done, but not how. Okay, and I can absolutely guarantee you that there is no requirement that your security officer be an information security professional. There is a requirement that you have to have somebody named. Okay, this is a good question. Does the software use an algorithm to calculate the probability to impact? No, we've left that totally subjective. We believe that any kind of algorithm approach where we are already calculating the algorithms takes away the entire purpose of a risk assessment, and that purpose is for you to think hard about your operational environment and what's the probability of this threat impacting your vulnerability here in your practice. And if it happens, what's the impact to your practice? Any kind of a priori calculation of probabilities it's just nonsense because every organization is different. Now, what I explained to you before, though, is we take that and we reduce that to a, a number of clicks. Calculate a probability. What does that mean? That doesn't mean, you know, uh, go back to your stats book. That means select high, medium, or low. Impact. It's going to bring the entire business down. It's going to bring our uh, EMR system down. It's going to be our practice management system down or add your own and then calculate high, medium, or low. Okay, Again, it's not an exercise in statistics. And then you've got a high, medium, or low probability. You've got a high, medium, or low impact. What do you think is the risk, high, medium, or low? That's about three or four clicks. Okay, Doesn't get any shorter than that. So any, any, any uh, mathematical calculation that somebody's trying to automate or do a forced ranking is really a, a fallacy in composition. This is totally a subjective exercise and that's the whole point of it is for you to think hard about your operational environment and how it works. Uh, is Expresso 
currently available or is it still being developed? No, it's going to be shipping in two uh, months, and we're going to get to uh, a, some, uh, and I'm going to let John walk through this. We are, we specified it, uh, and we, we have specified it pretty in pretty much detail, and we should be shipping this thing in a couple of months. So this is, and John, just go over, I, I don't really mean this to be an espresso demo, but just go over uh, at a high level some of the features here. Sure. So um, one thing that we've got here are the major categories. So um, as a part of our streamlining of the entire process, you need to be able to instantly access everything that's relevant. And those relevant things are your security objects, which we've talked about at length today. Of course, your threats, vulnerabilities, impacts, everything over here on your sidebar to the left. Much like QuickBooks, if you've ever used um, if you've ever used QuickBooks online, um, we intend for Expresso to be the QuickBooks of doing risk assessments. So um, to have everything go uh, very streamlined and also to to guide you through, so you always know where you are and what you're looking at. Is uh, risk assessments are hard enough without getting lost in your own um, in your own data. Now, one of the things that's not obvious here is that we, we have create for, for your security objects, we've created a tree, a, a category in a class. Now, you can add your own categories and classes, but for example, a category could be devices, okay? And under devices, you could have PCs, servers, uh, phones, printers, routers, okay? These are all hardware devices. So, and the idea is, that you can apply a control to a category class level, like I want to apply this control to all PCs, or I want to apply this control to all phones, or you could say, you know what, I want to apply this control to all devices in my entire security object list or inventory list, right, all of them, or to just a class underneath devices, or you could get down to I want to uh, I want to apply it just to a particular PC or a particular server, okay? And that's that's another way that you take maybe hundreds or thousands of security objects that you can say, oh yeah, this control applies to these 500, and you apply it once, and Espresso will automatically apply the control to all of these. Uh, now this was a a uh, just a graphic breakdown as to how we're going to categorize it, but you can change these. We're going to ship with devices, places, persons, networks. We're going to ship with these already. You can add your own. You don't have to use ours, right? If these if these work for you, and we're going to also ship with classes. If these work for you, use them. If they don't work for you, then redefine them and into a way that um, that they do work for you. Okay. And same thing with threat types. You can have natural, environmental, electronic. You know, we're going to have default. We're going to have default threats and default vulnerabilities that we ship with. But as uh, John said before, uh, you can change these. You can add. You can add these. And in fact, you obviously are going to add uh, these because you know threats and vulnerabilities because the threat landscape changes on uh, on a, on a daily basis. Right. So each one of these um, each one of these categories is its own tree, and uh, as you can see from the associations there, um, you can look at all the relationships that you have. So here we're looking at natural threats. You can see all of the security objects that a natural threat would uh, take advantage of, or all the risks that are associated, or all the controls that you've implemented, and you can modify those on the fly. And um, you can look at these relationships through either side of the lens. You know, you can go into your security objects, and through those associations, you can see what threats uh, uh, are applicable to it. Now, obviously, this these this is fake data, and we understand it's fake data because we wanted to get this out to developers, <laughs> to investors, to other people to get feedback on. But the development and the specification is happening pretty quick. We already showed you that spreadsheet where the next iteration of the demo is going to be using uh, the spreadsheet that we've come up here that applies directly to the security rule. 
And in fact, when we implement a control, there's going to be a security, there's going to be a an authority table, and you're going to be able to click on 164.308 and go look at the exact source code of this implementation specification as it exists in the security rule on the HIPAA survival guide. Okay, that's something that none of our competitors can do because none of them have the HIPAA survival guide to point to. We're going to point you to the authority that shows you that you are complying with this part of the security rule. Okay, so, uh, and this matrix here is pretty much complete. We're fine tuning it, we're doing it through some QA, but the development is not slowing down. We have a team of, of uh, developers that are already starting the development of Expresso, and then, you know, we're doing these, getting the data ready and the program ready on, uh, on essentially parallel tracks. Um, I'm not sure, well, here we're down to a particular risk, but what I want to get to is, at, at the end of the day, one of the things that, uh, and I, I guess I didn't capture that, was that there's a screen that shows you all the risk assessments that, you, that you've ever done, and you can keep as many uh, or as few as you would like. But I, I would expect that most organizations would keep the last four, five, six risk, risk assessments because if a, an auditor or a court of law wanted to see what you've been doing over time, you could go back and reproduce that. Right, right. Don't uh, don't delete them until the statute of limitations has run out. <laughs> so, who are the responsible parties for a, a risk assessment? Obviously, you, if you're the security officer, privacy officer, and many of you, um, you know, listening today are on the hook. Um, your compliance officer, your executive team, you know, uh, damn near anybody in the organization that amounts to anything is going to be held liable because. You know, we just live in a different world now. HIPAA is no longer a uh, paper tiger. And so what we try to do here is we try to take a really, really complex process as defined by NIST and productize it in a way that, that essentially turns it into the QuickBooks of risk assessments. That, not, that it makes account, not that it makes accounting enjoyable, right, because, you know, but it makes it, it less painful. And, in fact, uh, to be honest, I've I've actually grown to love, you know, because uh, you know I run I run a boutique law law firm, right? And I I have some partners and some associates and some other people that work with me. And you know, QuickBooks makes accounting so easy that you know I've learned to enjoy it. But 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 for that, it would be a nightmare to try to do because QuickBooks has automated interfaces between Bank of America, all your bank transactions flow. Etc. So that's sort of been the guidance for us. So I'm going to stop here before I do the shameless plug, Martin, just to see if there's any other questions. Martin. Yes, we do have some questions. I'm going to read two questions at once, and then they're almost the same, and then we have some more. Were you, were you off feeding your dogs? No, I, I was coughing and I turned it off. Oh, okay, so, all right. I, I, I want to make sure that your 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 babies get fed. No, they're 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 in good shape. Okay. Is Espresso right. cloud based? Is the one question, and this is the this almost the same question. How and where is the data stored with Espresso cloud or, or local file? And then I have some more questions as well. Yeah, it's going to be it, it, it's going to be cloud based. It's going to be completely cloud based. And we're going to sell it. Uh, anybody in your organization can use it based on one set of credentials as long as it's within one profit and loss center. So, for example, you know, if you're IBM and you've got 200, 300, or 1,000 profit and loss centers, well, you can't use Espresso for every one of those. You would have to buy one for each profit and loss center. But since our target market is small practices and mid-sized practices, you know, it's almost always going to be one profit and loss center, and so um, anybody really that's interested can log in uh, with, with your credentials. And, and and yes, it will be it will be SaaS based. Uh, some of the new guidance is asking the question: Are you qualified to perform the analysis? 
what is the qualification requirement? What guidance is asking that, that question? It doesn't say. That was my immediate question. I should have asked it. <laughs> I, I, I think I, I haven't seen any. I haven't seen any. Maybe there's vendors out there pushing that you got to be, you know, you have to have IPSCC after your initials and blah, 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 blah. None of that exists. None of that exists in the rules itself. You have to be qualified. Yes, you have to. You have to have some knowledge of the rules, and we have, we have over, um, we're close to twenty m modules. We have audit training modules. We have training modules on each one of the rules. Uh, we have a comprehensive set. Probably, I, I don't know if you went into the number of hours, forty or fifty hours of of training. And I guarantee you that uh, if you take that training and take the test. You're going to be qualified, as qualified as anybody else, and probably more qualified than 99.95% uh, of your peers. That already comes with our subscription. You can get that today. Okay, Espresso is going to be something that you get on top of that. And then, like I said, if you get the subscription before March 15th, then you're going to get Espresso for $7.95. You're not going to pay any more than that, and you're only going to have to uh, renew at $4.95. Forever. Otherwise, the renewal for the, subscri the subscription plan with Espresso is going to be twelve ninety five. Martin, I'm waiting for you. Okay. The, is there a retention requirement for RAs? Well, the, the you know the, again, the the rules are descriptive. They tell you what. They don't tell you how and how many and how long you got to keep them. But um, look, you know, if something like Espresso lets you keep four, five, six, seven of your last risk assessment, why wouldn't you do that just so that you could report on it? There's no rule that says you got to keep X amount. It's just uh, best practices would dictate that you should keep X number. Okay. Can multiple people be on Expresso at the same time? No. That is one limitation. The limitation is going to be on, under one set of credentials, one person is logged in at the time at a time. Okay. We don't. Um, we don't. Uh, at, at least, at least, release one O does not anticipate any kind of multi-user access. That that could be something that we add on release two, release three, something like that. Right. Okay. Okay. Do we have a demo webinar scheduled for Expresso? Actually, there's a. Um, you could send out that announcement, Martin, that we sent out with the with the video, right? And yes, uh, uh, we got some other deadlines that we're working on right now. And and, and um, actually, John will be putting together a demo with with that data, that spreadsheet, you know, so we don't have just dummy data in there. And, you know, sometime over the next couple of weeks, maybe we'll do a, uh, just a special webinar just on Espresso demo itself, maybe, you know, half hour or something like that. Um, this is just a comment from one of our attendees. As an expert witness regarding HIPAA breaches and HIPAA compliance, we have subpoenaed several years RAs regarding the assessment in place at the time of the breach, which, you know, is indicative that, yes, you should keep your RAs. Right. There you have it. I mean, people are going to want to know not only what, what you did last year, what, are you, what, what have you been doing over time? I mean, there's right. no reason, really, to, to uh, get rid of them, I mean, uh, especially with Expresso. You know, it's a cloud-based uh, system. Uh, we're going to have plenty of space. It's, it's not like um, the data associated with, with any one risk assessment is, is going to take up you know, gigs and gigs of data. Uh, there's really no reason not to keep them. And there was one one request uh, would be is if we can get this out before 3:15. Get Expresso out. I think that's what it's saying here. <laughs> I think somebody's. I thought like 3:15 like right. like, like today. No, that's oh, not. No. Oh no, that, that's I'm not. sorry. I've been corrected. It's the demo. Oh, the demo will be the, the demo will be out by th before three fifteen. Yeah, the demo could be out in a couple of weeks. The the yeah, there's no way that the, that we're actually going to ship in in uh, um, you know by three fifteen. Even though we have an ambitious uh, ship date, we're not going to ship until we got something that we're we're satisfied 
um, has been tested, and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, yeah, we're, you know, the, the ship date is the ship date is um, 60 days. So we're looking at a pretty quick ship date here from today, approximately. All right. Well, that's all we have on the questions. All right. Well, I'm going to just finish out here. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for uh, participating. Uh, we do feel like we provide the recipe, not just the ingredients. We provide today educational products that you can execute starting on day one. They're all agile based. Yeah, we're agnostic as to whether you're a business associate or a covered entity. Uh, we like to think we provide wetware, which is the how-to knowledge of what you need, not just software uh, that serves as a uh, repository of documents. I mean, uh, you could do a repository on a network share or SharePoint or Google Apps or something like that. What you really need is the how-to information that we provide. So uh, thank you for being with us. We had great attendance today, great questions. It's been my pleasure uh, being with you guys today. Look forward to the next webinar. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.